Isaiah chapter 20, Proverbs, the 20th book of the Bible. Now, what we're going to read here is a prophecy. And the prophecy came to pass. It's just when you look at the commentators, it wasn't this man, it was that man. It wasn't this man, it was that man. It wasn't this ruler, it was that ruler. But there's one thing that they all come to the conclusion. It did happen according to, to what God prophesied. And the main interest to be is God wrote it down through Isaiah before it happened. That's prophecy. In the year of Tartan, and he reigned from 722 to 7. 15 B.C., if I can read my writing, came unto Ashdod, Ashdod is a city, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, Sargon the man, sometimes not, not the man, it's a title, king of Syria, sent him and fought against Ashdod, the city, and took it. All right, so we're given a date here. And I didn't look up this date, but you can date. Sometimes the Bible gives us the date, the year. How come we're learning a date about a prophecy of a Syria attack in Egypt in Ethiopia? And we can go back to the Chronicles again. It, it, the, the date varies. How come we can go back into the Chronicles of History and say, ha ha. This is, this is about when it happened. And when we come to Ezekiel, Ezekiel forever on this month, on this day, and this year. Many times through the book of Ezekiel. And you would think that God would say it was very important that Jesus was born on this month, on this day, and this year. And it's not. And that God gives us precise on the month of Abed, on the 14th of Abed, you're to slay at even 6 p.m. the Passover lamb. There are things that are more important. We know the date of the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We can come to the date of the prophecy of Isaiah through God or God through Isaiah. But we don't have the date of the birth of Jesus Christ. And churches lavish in December 25th, which ain't, and some of them say, well, that's not the birthday of Jesus. And then they'll go ignore history and church history. This is important that, like I said, so many, if you want to study, and I'll leave it to yourself, because the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. I'm going to leave the study yourself. Go and study Isaiah chapter 20 and find the information I found. And there's, there's several different dates and, and activities, but there's one conclusion. It did happen, and it was written before it happened. At the same time, spank the Lord. <coughs> the same time that uh, Tardan fought against Ashwood and took it. Right around that time, looking up in history, The Lord by Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 20, the Lord by Isaiah the son Amos saying, this is a dated thing by God. Go and loose the sackcloth from, thy, from off thy loins. So Isaiah is already in sackcloth. And we haven't seen anything about sackcloth. Isaiah is in mourning. Of what he is prophesying, what God is showing him about the condition of his Israel, of Israel, his people, by being in sackcloth. And God says, 
Take off that sackcloth from off thy loins. Put now when I watch this, I saw this. Put off thy shoe from thy foot. I had a grandmother. Uh, she would tell you, we, we come into her house, she'd take off your shoes. And we had to take off our shoes. And there's been many places I've been where, can you please take off your shoes? Sure, no problem. It doesn't say put off thy shoes. It says put off thy shoe. It's singular. It's not plural. And the same thing too is, I'm checking here is, that, let me check over here. Okay, Israel. It led you 40 years in the wilderness, your clothes not wax upon you. Thy shoe is not waxed. But when we come across here, when God's dealing with, with, with Moses, he tells him, put off thy shoes. Okay, and there's one other place I want to check. Uh, Joshua. I thought God told him to take off his shoes too. I'm checking it. Okay, for Joshua, the captain of the Lord's host, loose thy shoe from off thy foot. That's a remarkable expression that to Moses, take off your shoes, plural. To Isaiah, take off thy shoe from thy foot. It's singular. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. And that's a great doctoral fighting and debating. You know, Isaiah was completely naked. Isaiah wasn't completely naked. Well, we'll just read the Bible. And the Lord said, now notice the, notice the, the reaction of Isaiah is he does not fight. He does not argue with the Lord. Take off your shoe. Take off that sack off. Okay. Now listen, this is not the time of Daytona Beach, Florida. This is not Hollywood where everybody goes naked. Woohoo! This would be a shameful thing, whether it be fully naked or even half naked. And I know, I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida. It's no shame at all. And I've seen Bane and suits, if you want to call it Bane. Maybe Isaiah had more clothes on than that Bane and suit. But it would be a shame for God to say, Isaiah, take off your clothes, where it, that's not a shame today. So when you read Isaiah chapter 20, forget about the debate. Realize what God's telling him. And take the Americanism out of the Bible. Take off the, the European monster, you know, of nude beaches. And, take that off. This is the fact is that God is telling Isaiah to do something that's very shameful. It would cause Isaiah to blush. There's no blushing today. And the Lord said, like as my servant. Isaiah is a servant of God. And this is an interesting note for other servants in the Bible, Job. And this is God saying, my servant, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Caleb, Elkim. Cyrus, Zerubbabel, and Nebuchadnezzar are called God's servants. And Isaiah. Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot. Now, again, there's this great 
debate. I'm going to take you to one Bible verse, and we're going to end the debate. Ready? Genesis chapter 2. Scripture with Scripture. Scripture with Scripture, right? When in doubt, check it out. And let's look at the first time the word naked shows up in the Bible and end the debate. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Kind of interesting. God just brought the woman to him. That's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Kind of interesting what we're going to look at the context. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And then they sinned against the Lord, and they sewed fig leaves together, and, call, and, and covered their vital sexual parts. Okay. The first time word shows up in the Bible. All right, here's Isaiah. He's naked. Running back to the first time the word naked shows up in the Bible. Okay. Walk naked and barefoot three years for us. Three years? <laughs> right. Three hours, Lord. No, three years. For a sign. Jews require a sign. But this sign is not really to Israel. It's to Assyrian Egypt. And we saw the last chapter that there are signs to Egypt. Listen, all those plagues in Exodus were signs to Israel and to the, to the, to the Egyptians. That there were a mixed multitude, mean Egyptians came out with Israel. That there was a point in time, uh, I forget what it was, but it was, you can bring in your servants and your animals, or you can leave them out. I forget, it was the, I think it was the, the hail, the fire, and all that. And there were some Egyptians like, whoa, that God is powerful. Everybody come on in. And then there were some Egyptians, stay out there. I mean, the signs for Israel taught the Egyptians, some of them, that's a mighty powerful God. I better obey him. And you, I always wondered, were there some Egyptians who actually put the blood over their doors, like the Jews did? Were there some Israelites that did not put the blood under doors like the Egyptians did? I wonder those two things. And then here's this thing I worry, I wonder about, not worry, with Isaiah. This guy is a sign for the people. Jeremiah is told not to marry. Ezekiel's wife is taken in death by a stroke, and, and God tells Ezekiel, thou shalt not cry. That's one of the things I don't like about God. I'll be honest. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't like that about God. When other people suffer and have problems for other people. And the hard thing about with Isaiah, with Israel, with Jeremiah, with Israel, with Ezekiel assigned to Israel, I mean Israel, the whole nation. Moses was assigned to the children of Israel <coughs> and the aspect of Israel. Things happened to Moses. Things happened to Isaiah. Things happened to Jeremiah. Things happened to Ezekiel for other people. And the other people didn't learn, didn't care. And I don't like that about God. 
I'm being perfectly honest. God knows I'm being perfectly honest. There are things in my life that may have happened for somebody else and somebody else may not have gotten it. You just don't dare to be honest enough with God like I'm honest with God. And I've got to think about myself and you got to think about yourself. Is somebody else suffering for us to learn a lesson? Are we learning that lesson? Think about that. Don't think about us suffering for somebody else. Think about somebody else going through trials and tributes and, and troubles and, and things in your life for a sign for, for me or for you. And are we paying attention to God? Or is that person going through whatever God's putting them through through us in vain because we're not listening, we're not paying attention? I'll tell you another aspect. And everybody knows I'm looking for a wife. I'm praying to God for a wife. What if God says, okay, I got a woman for you. <laughs> hey, man, glory to God. But she's not listening to me. I've been telling her, so listen, do this, and this, it would get you two together and would answer your prayers. But I keep telling her to do something, and she won't do it. And me, I'm like, Lord, if she's not listening, all right, let's go for, let's go for door number two. And eventually that may happen. That we've got to realize what we're learning. Isaiah, did he go bare naked? Or did he have? That's not the point. There are people out there that God is using for us. And woe if they suffer and we don't learn the lesson. Now, we're looking at Egypt. In chapter 19, we see that Egypt is going to get right with God in the millennium. And it's times like the book of Exodus. <coughs> and it's time with chapter 20 that maybe Egypt's going to get to the point before chapter 19. They're, they're going to go through the scriptures and say, hey, look at that. God spoke about our nation and it came to be exactly as God. All right. God is the God, the God of the Bible, the, the Hebrew God, the, the Jehovah. That is God and believe on him. When Christians go out and preach the gospel to people, to the lost, to the world, the world doesn't realize, you know, we're giving up time, we're giving up money, we're giving up, we're sacrificing, though they don't believe, we are sacrificing so that they can get the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what a wonderful, great thing to get to glory. Hey, listen, you know what? I, I, a couple times I hated you, I ranked on you, I, I cursed you, and you know, you still did what, and you know, I didn't get saved from you, I got saved later on, but you were part of my salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, glory to God. How about the man that goes to hell? Now, we've been at the farmer's market for six years. Let, let's take any vendor. And there's been a couple vendors that been there for the full six years, some not as long. We see vendors come, we see vendors go. But let's let's take an, a vendor of X, Y, Z. And let's say he's been there most of the time I've been there, and and I don't like that guy. I wish that guy would go, blah, blah, blah. And, and he ends up with a great white throne judgment because he never believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. That man gave up, you know, that man I sent, my Christian, my child, my bride, he could have stayed in bed. He could have done other things. He could have taken a job on Saturdays. But no. And you had the nerve to say he didn't love you? You had the nerve to say that he was wicked and vile and cruel? I can imagine there are people for three years talking about Isaiah. Can you just imagine the Jewish people talk... When he walked by to do his grocery shopping. Whether he's stark naked or covered, whatever it is, it is a shameful thing. 
and you know he was talk. As my servant Isaiah walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. I know Paul says signs for Jews, but here is a sign for Egypt and Ethiopia. And who is the first nationality of a person to be saved on how a person is saved in the church age today? An Ethiopian reading Isaiah 50. Reading the very chapter we're going to come up to in 33 chapters. I won't say 33 days because some chapters take more than. Now, isn't that interesting? You ever wonder? See, I wonder. Was it just Isaiah 53? Did he happen to have Isaiah 19 and 20? He imagined, hey, hey, that's my people. And then he flips over to chapter 53 and three in it. I don't know. So, so, Shall the king of Assyria, and like I said, you can read, there, I've, I've seen three different kings, they said this happened. And there may, there may have been three different events. There were three different times that Babylon came into Judah. So shall the king of Assyria, it doesn't give a name. But the name we do get, Sargon, verse 1. And one of the references I read, they said it wasn't Sargon. So shall the king of Assyria lead away, lead away the Egyptians, prisoners. That's not good. And the Ethiopians captives. Taken. In battle. Young and old. Naked and barefoot. Like Isaiah was. Even with their buttocks uncovered. What are you going to do with that one? I've seen bathing suits, I'm sorry to say, in Daytona Beach where their buttocks are uncovered, but, I mean, they did have a covering. Okay, maybe. But I know David's men, when David sent them to the king because, because his father died, and I know that they shaved half their beard and cut their garments in half to the buttocks. 2 Samuel 6.14 to the shame of Egypt. Now that's not a shame today. I know and I've read about there are places in New York, I think the city, where women are allowed and legally to go topless. And they do. And we have an ordinance I read in Daytona Beach that the ordinance says that nothing of the Pribley area, imagine how they use the Bible, can be exposed or you will, you can be arrested for indecent exposure. Nakedness. But can you imagine, let, let's take the United States in whole, let's say uh, all 50 states, that they would make a law and say tomorrow, the, uh, January 24th, 2021, as of January 24th, 2021, at midnight, clothing are an optional in public. Man, can you imagine what Americans would be would be doing tomorrow? You imagine what it'd be like at the, at the grocery store if nudity would be legalized. Man, you couldn't go anywhere. 
There would be no shame is what I'm saying. There would be no blushing. Isaiah would be blushing. Isaiah would be in shame. And so would be the Ethiopians and the Egyptian. Their heads are hanging low. They're in chains. They're, they're butt naked where this expression comes from. Comes out of the King James Bible, butt naked. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. Oh, the great pride, oh, the great proudness reduced to chains and butt naked. Being taken as captives and prisoners. There was a time in American history when you were arrested that you would be brought in as a group of men or women, but segregated. And you would be brought into this room and you'd be lined up and you would be butt naked. And they would go to the series of de lousing. And then you would get your clothes and you would be marching off naked as you would head to your, your pod or your cell. That you would walk in front of the entire population of the jail, but naked. Now that would be a great, great reward today. And the inhabitant of the isle, and I have no idea what that isle is, but that's the first time it shows up there. Shall say in that day, uh-oh, there's in that day again. Behold, such is our expectation. That butt nakedness, that, that prisoner, that captivity, that's what's going to happen to us. Do you realize a lost soul at the great white throne judgment is butt naked before God? Naked. I don't care. There is no death. There is absolutely no clothing. Everything properly say and be decent. Everything hanging out before God, Jesus Christ. You ain't got no pockets. What are you going to do with that one? The only ones that are clothed are the righteous, the, the fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saint. The saints are clothed. Whether we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Syria, we're, we're, we're going to run. But the, the main conclusion would be, how shall we escape? We don't want to end up like them. Listen, if, if in America today, if one group of people ripped off their clothes and they protested and they had signs and they, they fought their congressmen and they fought the leaders and they got the laws passed that we can go naked, everybody, hey, let's get naked in America. But here, nakedness is, oh, cover up. I can imagine when they're in chains, you know they're in chains. I can imagine that what, what, what their hands are covering parts of their body. Have you ever seen pictures of the consecration cramp, camps of the Nazi parties of the Jewish people? They'll be lined up, and guess what? They don't have no clothes. What are you going to do with that one? When, and it's evil thing, slavery, when they went over to Africa and they got slaves and they put them on the boat to bring them over, guess what they were? Most of them were naked. Some had covering.
nakedness was and was supposed to be ashamed. Not today. I mean, there is a reason why it streaker streaks and runs. Because you're not supposed to be naked. 